Hi, I'm Richard McKenzie, co-author of Microeconomics for MBAs. This video module is going to be on the law of demand. Uh, admittedly, we've taken this uh, concept up again, but it's, it's worth uh, c considering a second time, uh, mainly because of its importance within economic analysis. And there's much more that we can say about the law of demand and how it is derived and, and also take up uh, uh, concerns that students often have about uh, reliance on the law of demand. Now, the law of demand basically is the assumed inverse relationship between the price of the good and the quantity uh, consumers and are willing and able uh, to buy, uh, ceteris paribus, or everything else uh, held uh, constant. That law of demand can be observed everywhere in, in marketplaces. Uh, the law of demand can also be derived from rational behavior. Um, you may recall that we define rational behavior as that set of uh, human actions that are consistent with individual wel welfare maximization. Uh, rational behavior is founded upon the presumption that people are able to identify their wants and needs within uh, limits. They're able to order their uh, wants and needs within reasonable limits, and they're able to choose consistently upon that ordering in order to maximize uh, their individual uh, well-being. Uh, there are two deductions that we can draw uh, from uh, rational behavior that are relevant to the construction of the law of demand. First off, <clears throat> uh, we can assume that a rational person will fully allocate his or her uh, uh, income or fully use his or her uh, resources. If the person hasn't fully allocated, uh, then that person hasn't maximized the well-being. If a person starts off with $100 and leaves uh, five dollars uh, unallocated, that is, he or she has no intended purpose, then that individual uh, is foregoing some utility from using the five dollars to, to buy uh, some good, for example, a glass of wine. So we know a rational person will fully allocate uh, his or, or her income. A rational person will also equate uh, at the margin. By this, I mean that the individual will con continue to consume goods until the marginal value or the marginal benefit or the marginal utility of the last unit of any one good is equal to the marginal uh, value or marginal benefit or marginal utility of every other goods. Let's suppose we only have uh, two goods uh, in the world and that the price of these uh, two goods are the same. That is, price of A is equal to the price of B, and they're both equal to uh, $1. How should a person uh, equate at the margin? Well, what we've just said is that the rational person will make sure that, the last, uh, that on the last unit of A consumed, uh, the marginal utility of A will equal to the marginal utility of, of B. If the equality is not struck, that is, if a person has fully allocated his or her income and has the marginal utility of the last unit of A greater than the marginal utility of the last unit of B, then the individual clearly has not maximized uh, welfare, mainly because the individual can spend one less dollar on, on MU sub B and take that one dollar, allocate it to A, and will gain more uh, utils of satisfaction. The person here may get 10 utils of satisfaction from the last unit of B, 15 from A. By taking a dollar away from B, the individual gives up uh, one uh, unit of B at losing 10 utils. The individual gains one unit of A, acquiring uh, eight utils of, of satisfaction. So we know that the individual is going to move uh, expenditures from B into A so long as uh, the margin utility of A is greater than B. Now, as the individual moves uh, from A to B, we can imagine that it's beyond some point. The margin utility of A will begin to decline uh, as more is consumed. The margin utility of B will begin to uh, rise as less of that is consumed. Moral of the story is, at some point, uh, these two margin utilities will come into um, will we'll come into e equality. Now let's suppose uh, that the price of A and B or the prices of A and B are, are different. What should the individual do uh, then? Well, a rational person will equate 
uh, these ratios. That is, the marginal utility of A per penny is going to be equal to the marginal utility of B uh, per, per penny. What if the um, uh, ratio is, is not equal? That is, uh, MUA over PA is greater than MUB over uh, PB. What should the individual do? Well, again, the person gets more utility per penny for A than uh, per penny for B. The individual can take a penny or a dollar or five dollars, whatever it happens to be, move it from B to A and acquire more utils of satisfaction uh, per penny from A than uh, he or she loses uh, from giving up a unit of B. Uh, the person should continue to move from uh, B to A until there is uh, an equality. Now the important point here is that once we've established quality or equality or consumer equilibrium, let's suppose uh, that the price of A goes down. And if the price of A goes down, what we can observe here is that the uh, uh, ratios are no longer uh, equal. That is, the margin utility of the last uh, penny spent on A now becomes greater than the margin utility of the last penny spent on B. The result of the matter is that the individual should once again move from uh, B into A. So what we have here is a, is, is a point that's uh, very important in economics. You lower the price of A, and what happens? Uh, the consumer equilibrium is upset. People will uh, naturally gravitate from B to A. Price of A goes down. The quantity of A purchased uh, goes up. Uh, what is that? It's uh, nothing more than the statement of the, of the law of demand, which we have captured in a, in a graph in an earlier video module, uh, that looks uh, something uh, like this. And what this graph basically says is that if you start out at price P1, consumers will buy uh, quantity uh, Q1. If you lower the price of this good for some reason, you, you upset the equality of the margin utility ratios that I just discussed, people will move from other goods uh, into the consumption uh, <clears throat> of this good. And the result is the price goes down, the quantity demanded uh, goes up. We could do the opposite. We could go the price goes up, the quantity demanded uh, uh, goes uh, down. Now, really, I have drawn this uh, demand curve as a, as a thick line. But you must understand that the demand curve really is a dividing boundary between price-quantity combinations like little a, that are acceptable to consumers and price quantity combinations like B uh, that are unacceptable. This demand curve represents a boundary, the limit price that people are willing to pay for any given um, uh, quantity. People are willing to pay at the limit price P1 for quantity Q1. Now I could draw the demand curve as a thin line as I have done here, uh, but the I. I don't use this kind of demand curve for a, a good reason. Um, uh, one reason is that it's so thin, uh, many viewers may have trouble uh, seeing it. Secondly, uh, you know, if, if I wanted to represent uh, uh, the demand curve as a boundary, it would be a razor edge uh, kind of, of curve. And that would, would of course, make uh, for difficult uh, uh, graphical uh, presentations.